greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God and through his infinite mercy, we are here to remember with great celebration Marilyn Fawcett, a woman who knew the Lord Jesus Christ as her personal savior, a woman that we are guaranteed with assurance that she is in heaven today with him. We draw your attention to just a few things in the bulletin. First of all, we will remain seated for all of the hymns except the final hymn when the roll is called up yonder. The second thing, you will find an insert of the hymn Come Labor On, which will be the solo today, but I think most of you do not know it. But so that you can follow along with the words, that insert is in your bulletin today. Third, when you stand to give your testimony concerning the life of Marilyn and how it affected you, we request that you please come to the podium here rather than standing in the seat where you are because we are being broadcast over the internet and people will not be able to hear who are listening over the internet unless you come and speak into the microphone here. All the scripture readings will be done from the pulpit up here. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for Marilyn Fawcett and for her life and testimony, for her zealous work for Jesus Christ, for her love for him and her faithfulness to him. We thank you, Father, that she has gone before us and that someday we as believers will see her again. We thank you, Father, that you give to each one of us the comfort, the encouragement, and the strength necessary for this hour. We pray, Father, that truly this would be a time of worship, worship of you, our living God, worship of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who bought us with his blood. Father, we pray that you will give us encouragement from your word, that you will make us more focused in our walk through this life so that we focus on things of heaven, not on things of earth, which are very trivial and which pass away. We pray that you will make all of us more diligent, cause all of us to be more faithful and sensitive to the needs of those around us, those who are lost and who do not yet know Jesus Christ. Father, we come before you this day with thanksgiving. We come before you with soberness of mind we come before you seeking your blessing and your power in our lives that we might live for Christ so long as we are here on earth. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 694, The Lord's My Shepherd.
this time we'd like to open the microphone to those of you who want to share a testimony about what Marilyn's life meant in your life. It can be a humorous story. It can be some impact that she made whereby she helped you to see what you should be doing as a believer. Whatever you would like to share, please come to the microphone up here at the front so that it can be recorded and also heard over the internet. We invite you to come at this time.
Ronald Reagan was referred to as the great communicator, and I think we could always refer to Marilyn as the great communicator, as there were those who would be new guests in the church, at a banquet, various things, she would be there communicating with them. Her keyboard was retired in honor of her because many of the keys were unreadable. They were worn down because she is the great communicator, and Charlotte and I had a difficult time figuring out where certain keys were because they were all missing. But communication is important to her, and whether it was a responsibility, whether it was a witness, whether it was the transfer of information, that was her heart's desire. Not a solitary person, but one upon which the Lord had granted that particular gift, and it was used for his glory. I have a letter from Gary and Pat Johnson. It said, it's with sad hearts that Pat and I are not able to be with you at this time. We know that, as 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, we are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I, Gary, first met Marilyn in September 1965 when I arrived at Wingy for my first two-year term of mission service. Marilyn had already been there for two to three years, and I immediately saw that she was a hard worker. I guess that is why the Akamba people gave her the name Maui. Maui, did I do good? Not too much for Akamba. Which means hard worker. Whatever project Marilyn went after, she did it with all her might, even if it made her sick from exhaustion at the end. She had a great love for the Lord Jesus Christ and to tell others of his saving grace. She was a true missionary and a great nurse, but lacked knowledge in auto mechanics. Once while on her, her oil light came on, she banged the dashboard with her hand to get it to go off. What it really needed was some oil to be added to the engine. She solved the problem by buying another car. Marilyn built up a wonderful maternity work at the R.K. Arms Hospital where she taught many African student nurses. She was great in teaching deliveries and working with the new mothers. From her example and teaching, several of the students went on to further medical training and into the medical field. Marilyn was greatly missed in the hospital when she came home to help her parents. She then worked hard in the board office getting out the prayer letters and prayer, praise and prayer to many of the supporters and friends of the board. We are sad at her home going, but blessed to have known and worked with her. She is now with the Lord, whom she loves more than life itself. Marilyn, we will see you again in glory. Gary and Pat Johnson. So we're thankful for that testimony, and that, I think, reflects the testimony of all in one fact or another in her life. As we look to the scriptures, words of God's words of comfort, I'll be reading from John chapter 14, the first six verses. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me.
promise of heaven, taken from Revelation 22, 1 through 7. And then following that, uh, Ms. Fawcett's obituary. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, <clears throat> neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them the light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to the show his, unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy 
of his book from uh, Ms. Fawcett's uh, obituary. <clears throat> Marilyn Virginia Fawcett, 77 years of age, resided in Orland, Pennsylvania, went home to be with the Lord on October 10th, 2016 at 5.23 p.m. from the Joseph C. Scott Medical Center in Rydell, Rydell Pennsylvania, after a year-long battle with cancer. Marilyn was born June 13, 1939, in Cleveland, Ohio, of A. Franklin and Mildred Coey uh, Fawcett. Marilyn graduated from Lakewood High School, Lakewood, Ohio, class of 1957, after which she took her nursing course at West Suburban Hospital and School of Nursing at Oak Park, Illinois, and later completed her Bachelor of Science degree from Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois. Immediately after receiving her nursing degree, Marilyn was sent out to the Mission Board Hospital in Mwingi, Kenya, as a missionary nurse under the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. She took time off to go to Wheaton College to finish her college degree, and later in her missionary nursing career, she went to Scotland for a midwifery course necessary for the work in Mwingi. Marilyn was a beloved sister and friend of many. She served the Lord faithfully on the mission field and here in the States in various capacities, including her last employment at the Independent Board. Marilyn was preceded in death by her parents and an elder brother, Robert W. Fawcett, spouse June Stir Fawcett. She is survived by her brother, D. Eugene Fawcett, and wife, Charlotte Jacobson Fawcett, eight nephews and nieces. And they are Douglas R. and Marilyn Fawcett, Sandra Fawcett, uh, Stoward and Scott Stoward, David I. and Charlene Fawcett, Stephen M. and Brenda Fawcett, Daniel P. and Jamie Fawcett, Deborah Fawcett Lopez and Moises Lopez, Jonathan G. and Barbara Fawcett, Timothy J. and Kinsey <coughs> Fawcett. Marilyn is also survived by 37 great nephews and nieces and 16 great great nephews and nieces. Funeral service will be held, was held on Wednesday, October 19th at 11 a.m. at the chapel at George Washington Memorial Park, 80 Stenton Avenue in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania. 19462, where friends will be were received from 10 to 11 a.m. interment in George Washington Memorial Park. In lieu of flowers, memorials may be made to the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, 1115 Haddon Avenue, Collingswood, New Jersey, 08108, or the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions, P.O. Box 1346, Bluebell, Pennsylvania, 19422. Please turn your hymn books to 707, He Giveth More Grace. Oh! 
God's way to heaven. Romans 1, 1 through 4. Romans 1, 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And then we have 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures.
Servant, well done. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 19. I'll be reading verses 23 through 27. Job chapter 19. words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Our gracious Father, again we commit the word of God into your care and keeping as it comes to our hearts and that it would not return unto you void but that it would accomplish that which you please and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it for we pray it in Jesus name Amen in terms of setting quill to parchment Job is perhaps the oldest book of the Bible, and yet it gives this startling, crystal clear picture of the resurrection. Or perhaps we should say of two resurrections, the resurrection of the Redeemer and the resurrection of the believer who sees both resurrections with the eye of faith. Both are inseparably joined together. Without the first, the second cannot take place. The resurrection of the body is not, as the liberals claim, a, quote, late theological development unheard of until the second century of the Christian era, but it is an infinite truth rooted deeply in the very nature of God, the God of life, and is clearly expressed from the earliest revelation of God himself given in scripture. The doctrine of the resurrection is not merely a reaction to the Gnostic teaching of disembodied spirit apparitions. The resurrection is revealed in the earliest manuscript evidence of Job long before the heresy of Gnosticism penetrated the early church with its denial of the heart of the gospel. As Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. His bodily resurrection as the first fruits is the guarantee that the rest of the crop will also spring up in resurrection bodies. It is not allegorical, it is not mythological, it is not symbolic or figurative, it is literal. The resurrection of Christ was the resurrection of his body. In the same manner the resurrection of the believers will be in their bodies. It is a real resurrection, not merely a phantasmagoric visible appearance of our disembodied spirits. Job wanted his words to be written in a book. Indeed, he received the desire of his heart. His words were written in a book, in the eternal word of God. His words were not only written, they are preserved. His words were not only preserved, they were translated so that we have them before us at this very hour to give hope and comfort and help in our hour of grief. Words written more than 4,000 years ago by a man suffering the most anguishing pain and sorrow that can be imagined have once again been spoken aloud this day to comfort our hearts with the most incredible of all promises, the guarantee of the resurrection. 
Job not only wanted his words to be written in a book, Job wanted his words to be permanent. In verse 24 we read, Oh, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. The answer to that prayer was even better than his deepest desire. Because it was God the Holy Spirit who inspired those words through Job's suffering. They were not merely engraved in a rock with molten lead poured in to preserve them for future generations. They were permanently and unchangeably engraved in heaven itself. Psalm 119.89 says, Lamed, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Job had no question that he had a living Redeemer, one who was actually able to help him in his time of distress. His Redeemer was not a Redeemer made of clay or stone or metal. His Redeemer was alive. What a delightful fascination it is to see that the word Redeemer in this passage is the word Gaal, the kinsman Redeemer. This is the same word used of Boaz as the kinsman redeemer of Ruth. This is the word used throughout the Old Testament, throughout all of its law of the one who had both the right and the responsibility of delivering his near kin from the oppressor, of avenging the blood of a murdered kinsman, of buying back the land for his closest kin in the event that had been sold of buying the impoverished kin himself back from the slaveholder who had acquired ownership when the poor man went into debt. The kinsman redeemer who had the obligation of marrying the childless widow of his dead brother and providing in every way for the support of his near kin. That, of course, is the incredible picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a flash of divine revelation, Job foresaw the incarnation of Christ. Jesus would be our near kinsman because he would take on humanity through the virgin birth. He would be our near kinsman because he would be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. That Christ would be our near kinsman to redeem us from the oppressor and from death the killer. That Jesus would be the one who would buy back the land, the whole earth which was our rightful inheritance that was lost through the sin of Adam. That Jesus would be the one who would redeem us from the slavery of sin. That Jesus would raise up a spiritual seed to provide for us in every way. That the resurrected Christ would stand upon the earth in complete fulfillment of the role of the kinsman redeemer. An incredible foreshadowing of the return of Christ and the establishment of his millennial kingdom on earth. Job in that flash of revelation saw the incarnation, the sacrificial death of Christ, the resurrection and redemption of man from the curse of sin and death and the second coming. And all of this was revealed by God more than 4,000 years ago. But Job also foresaw his own resurrection after he had been completely and very graphically, as described in the text, after he had very graphically been eaten by worms. He knew that he would have to be dead a very long time, but that this was no obstacle for the one whom he knew was his kinsman redeemer. And he knew that it would be a bodily resurrection, not a spiritual resurrection. Remember what we just read in verse 26. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He knew that the promise was not just for us or for some later generation. He says, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. Today the mortal body of Maryland is lifeless in a grave in Pennsylvania. But the real Maryland... The Maryland who lived in that body is fully alive in the presence of Christ. But that's not all. 
The day is coming when that lifeless body in Pennsylvania will literally and bodily rise from the dead at the voice of the Son of God, and she shall see for herself. Her eyes shall behold her Redeemer in her resurrected body, not merely in the intermediate body which our Savior has given to her until the resurrection. As we remember the life of Marilyn Fawcett today, I want to share with you how we know for sure that she is in heaven, experiencing all that we've just read and just described. I also want to share with you how you can know for sure that heaven is yours as well, and that you'll be able to see her again someday. So let's talk about how we as human beings know things for sure, so that even children could understand this. We all believe that we know some things for sure. Some of the things we know because we have had experience. We know what ice cream tastes like because we've eaten it. We can tell the difference between chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. We know that it's supposed to be eaten when it's cold. We know the difference between the sound of a bird and a honking horn because we've experienced both. We know the pleasant feel of a cool sea breeze and the painful burn of a hot stove. Experiences come to us from the external world around us through our five senses, sight and taste, smell and hearing and touch. Many things we think we know for sure because we've experienced them in the physical realm. And after many similar encounters, we're confident that these tangible things are real and always have basically the same characteristics. But our physical senses are not always reliable. You know this. Sometimes your physical senses deceive you. We've all seen the sleight of hand artist who makes rabbits appear out of empty hats, or makes ping pong balls disappear, or cuts his assistant in half and then puts her back together again with no damage. We enjoy being fooled. Our taste buds deceive us when we drink diet cola and our brain believes we've tasted sugar instead of other highly complex chemicals. Electronic synthesizers can deceive us into thinking that we've heard a cello or a submachine gun or a creaking door. We think we know some things because we experience them with our five senses. Another way that we as human beings think that we know things for sure is when someone whom we trust tells us. We all grew up with parents who taught us not to run out in the street because we might be hit by a truck, not to scream at night because it annoys the neighbors, and to sit up straight at the table where we'll spill food in our laps. We graduated to kindergarten. We learned our colors, our numbers, and our letters. Then we learned that there are various shades of color, that numbers can be very big or very small. In fact, they can be so small that they're just tiny parts of other numbers. And when you put them together just right, they tell you all kinds of amazing things about the world around you. We learned that letters make words and had delight of learning the different ways to write letters and words and then to write sentences and then paragraphs and then essays and then stories. We trusted our teachers and we learned things that would help us in this life to succeed in the various talents that God gave to us. But sadly, we all know of times that people whom we trusted deceived us or tricked us or in some cases, and you see much of this in public schools today, we're just plain wrong. But there were other ways that we learned as well. We learned some things through direct memorization. We learned some things by discovering how to reason and to reach correct conclusions. We learned some things by scientific experiments that we repeated over and over and always got the same results. We learned what was called the scientific method and so we began to trust science. We also learned the truth about some things that we couldn't see with our eyes or hear with our ears or smell with our noses. We learned that dogs can hear and smell things that we can't hear or smell, and yet those sounds and smells were very real even though we couldn't sense them at all. But then we discovered that not all things are subject to the scientific method. We learned that some things are true even though we cannot repeat them under the same conditions multiple times. We learned that history is real. 
We learned about George Washington and the American Revolution. We learned about Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo. We learned about Genghis Khan and the Mongolian hordes and the Vikings and Julius Caesar when we struggled through the Gaelic Wars in Latin too. We read things written by eyewitnesses to the events. We saw artifacts and broken pottery and ancient relics. In all the museums that we visited and trusted the curators to tell us the truth about the events of history because they had spent so many years studying the tiny pieces of history and putting it together for us. Then we learned one that I like very much. We learned the legal method of analyzing truth about historical events. We saw that sometimes scientific evidence was presented, but many times the outcome of a trial depended solely on eyewitnesses and the veracity and consistency of their testimony with other eyewitnesses. We learned that some things are 100% true, even though we can't put them into a test tube. That's very important when we talk about heaven. When we talk about heaven, we have the privilege of using one other means of learning truth. It's very similar to some of the ways we've just briefly discussed, but it has an added element. As with the legal method, we have trustworthy witnesses. As with the scientific and historical methods, we can examine artifacts and writings. But the added element that we have when we talk about heaven is that God is added to the equation. We suddenly expand outside the physical realm of our five senses to something far larger, far more beautiful, far more glorious, and far more real. We now have someone whom we can trust 100%, more than we ever trusted a teacher or a friend or a cherished loved one. We've entered a realm where we have a witness who knows everything and who is never wrong. We've entered a realm where the witness never lies. We've entered a realm where the witness not only tells the truth, but he tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We've entered a realm where faith is never disappointed, never deceived, and never destroyed. When we speak of heaven, we've entered a realm where God has revealed himself to us in such a way that we can understand. We've entered a realm where God himself has penetrated human history personally and has given to us his written word so that we might know for sure the things that otherwise we could never know. Other ways that we learn to know truth may help us in a feeble way, but when we see what God has revealed through Christ and in his word, we can know the experientially unknowable with absolute certainty. We can know about heaven with precise accuracy. And we can know without a question or a doubt who makes it to heaven. We approach our quest for knowing about heaven in the same way that we trusted our parents, our teachers, our senses, our reason, our intuition. We come by faith. Oh yes, our faith is flimsy. Our faith is weak. Our faith is terrified. But the object of our faith is eternal, immovable, unchanging, irresistible, almighty, perfect, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, absolutely truthful and ever loving in our time of grief. Don't worry about how flimsy your own faith is. Look at the immutable object of your faith. That's what makes faith either valid or a fraud. Your faith is worth no more than the one in whom you put your faith. If the object of your faith is unreliable, it doesn't matter how much you believe because it will not improve the reliability of the one in whom you have put your faith. You can really, 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 really believe that a broken chair will hold you up and it'll still collapse. You merely set yourself up for delusion and disappointment. On the other hand, you can have a perfectly reliable object of faith and believe the wrong thing about him. And then you're suddenly surprised when he doesn't let you down. Sometimes, and this sadly often happens, a third thing, sometimes you want so badly to have something that you think your misplaced desire is faith. When you don't get what you wanted, you're disappointed. 
That often happens when we want desperately for a loved one to keep on living so that we will not have to experience the suffering of being separated. And then we're disappointed because we've trusted our own desires rather than looking at our loved one through the eyes of Jesus who loves that one more than we ever dreamed. Jesus, who has taken our loved one safely through the valley of the shadow of death to the place where there is no more death. Dearly beloved, what I said just a moment ago is true. Marilyn Fawcett is more alive today than she ever was here in this world. She is more beautiful than she ever was in this world. If you could see her now, her beauty would stun you. She is stronger and more alert today than ever before. All of her senses are perfect. She can see things that she never saw before. She can hear things that were impossible to hear in this world. She can taste and smell and touch textures she could never before discern. How do we know for sure? Because we have the promises of God who never lies and he has told us what we need to know to comfort our hearts on two critical issues. Number one, the reality of heaven. And number two, precisely who will be there? In the earlier part of this service, we read the incredible description of heaven given in Revelation 22. I encourage you to read all of Revelation 21 and 22 and meditate on the glorious description that is given to us there. It's a place of unspeakable beauty and majesty. It's a place of perfect holiness and joy. It's a place of music and singing. It's a place of blessed fellowship with Christians who have preceded us in death. It is a place where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigns. It is a place where we will work and serve Him with perfect joy and satisfaction of accomplishment. There will be no frustration at any inability to complete tasks assigned. It's a place where all tears are wiped from our eyes. It's a place where there is no more crying or sorrow or suffering or death or separation from our saved loved ones anymore. It is a place of glory and grace. It is a place of rest and peace. It is heaven. It is real. The living God who never lies has told us it is real. It is so magnificent that it is beyond the reaches of our pale senses even as the unseen bands of light in the outer reaches of the spectrum are beyond our sight and the ultra high frequencies are beyond our hearing. But the more pressing question for us at this hour is this. Who is there? How can we know for sure that Marilyn Fawcett is there? And here the word of God who cannot lie has also given us the answer. The God of all comfort who knows our distress at this hour has sent a soothing balm to quiet our souls. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Christians had died at Thessalonica. The church was in a state of distress. They were afraid of what had become of their loved ones. They were filled with sorrow. 
And so Paul wrote to remind them of the promises of God that those who sleep in Jesus are with him now because he will bring them with him when he returns. Verse 14, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That brings us to a crucial distinction. How do you know for sure that you are a Christian? How do you know for sure that if you die before the Lord returns, you will be in heaven with him? You know, there are some people who call themselves Christians, and we all know that they're not. Putting a wheelbarrow into a garage does not make it into a car, any more than putting a hypocrite into a church makes him into a Christian. There are real Christians, and there are phonies. What's the difference? Do you remember the passage we read in John 14? Jesus, in the very context of describing heaven and promising to prepare a place for us, told us how to get there. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The way to heaven is simple. The way to heaven is easy. The way to heaven is clear. The way to heaven is exclusive. The way to heaven is by trusting Christ alone. You see, we're all separated from God because of our sins. God is holy. We are unholy. God is righteous. We are unrighteous. But God made a way for us to be brought back to him. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and died to pay the penalty for our sins. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he says, that's the gospel by which you are saved. Not what you do, but what Christ did. That's what Paul calls the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day, bodily and literally. Paul says that's the good news. That's one of the best attested facts of history, the resurrection of Christ with over 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection described in detail in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the proof that his death for our sins accomplished its purpose, that he didn't merely die a martyr's death. Jesus promised it many times in the Gospels. We see in John 6, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, present tense, everlasting life. John chapter 10, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Marilyn Fawcett trusted Jesus Christ alone to save her from her sins. Marilyn was not relying on her personal goodness or her baptism or her ties or her church membership or her missionary service or her benevolent love for her family to get her into heaven. She trusted Jesus Christ to give her eternal life. That's how we know for sure that she's in heaven today, even as I speak. That's how we know for sure she has no more suffering or sorrow or pain. Listen carefully, friends. You can either believe the sovereign God of the universe who never lies, or you can call him a liar. Those are really the only two options. You know, it's, it's really curious because we're willing to believe people who are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. So what stands in your way of believing God who is never wrong? He has told us that heaven is real. He has told us that it is populated by a very specific group of people. He has told us that the only ones who are there are those who have trusted in Christ to save them. He has told us that they are eternally secure, that they can never lose their salvation. Marilyn trusted in Christ alone who died for her sins, who was buried and rose again the third day as prophesied by the scripture. Therefore, we know with certainty that Marilyn Fawcett is with our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven today. Remember what Jesus said? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If 
it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Just a few days ago, our Lord Jesus finished the mansion that he was preparing for Maryland. It was finished precisely on time. As our dear sister took her final breath, she reached out and took the hand of Jesus, who looked into her eyes and said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I also suspect that he may have said something like, Welcome home, Marilyn. Come see the beautiful place that I've just prepared for you. And it was indeed the most beautiful place she'd ever seen, but she couldn't take her eyes off Jesus. The nail-pierced hand that was holding her hand, the wounded side where he held her close, the gentle kindness as she gazed into his eyes, and saw his infinite love for her that sent him to the cross. Yes, we know for sure. We see it with the eye of faith in the one who is the object of our faith. That's what makes faith either valid or false. The object of our faith is Christ who never fails, who never leaves us, who never forsakes us, who always is there to comfort us in the hour of distress. The one who is our risen Lord who has gone to prepare a place for us if we will only trust in him. That's God's grace. We don't deserve it. But he offers eternal life and heaven to us if we will only believe in Jesus who bought it for us with his blood. Grace alone. Faith alone. Christ alone. Is Marilyn in heaven? Yes, because of the grace of God that drew her to trust in Christ alone. Will you see Marilyn again in heaven? Yes, emphatically, but only if you have trusted Christ alone to save you from your sins. Trusted the Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the power of your word, the incredible beauty of your word, the incredible comfort of your word, the incredible proof of your word by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we trust in you, the God who cannot lie and who is never wrong. How we thank you for Jesus, your Son, our Messiah, who loved us so much that he died for us, that he died for Marilyn, and that today she is with him in glory. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 774. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Every Bible Presbyterian funeral that I've done since I've been here, they sang that. We sang it at the graveside, but since we're not going to the graveside today, we'll sing it as our final hymn, number 774, and we'll stand to sing, When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs>